This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. This is Think Tech Asia, more specifically at the two o'clock block. And Russell Yu has come back from China. He goes back and forth. And he is a uh, Hawaii lawyer practicing in China and teaching at the Beijing Foreign Studies University, otherwise known as the Georgetown of China. Welcome back, Russell. Oh, Jay. Why do they call it the Georgetown of China? Because lot of similar institutions with uh, international publishers here. I'm teaching at the law school, uh, which is a mission that's being trained Chinese lawyers to be global lawyers. They all have to speak a second language, and they double major in English or Spanish. Interesting. Spanish. Spanish. I guess there's a lot of places in the world that speak yes, Spanish. The, the, the sure. new economies are all Spanish-speaking, so yeah. they're generating a lot of, uh, producing a lot of lawyers. But many of these lawyers, are, uh, law, law students, will graduate, take the Chinese bar, then go to U.S., uh, uh, a few years ago, they would uh, study and take the LM degree. Now they're taking actual JD courses. Yeah. And so uh, they go to U.S. law schools, yeah. get a JD, yeah. and then sit for the New York bar exam. Yeah. Oh, really? The yes. New York bar exam? Yes. Well, there's some Chinese firms. I mean, actually, Chinese firms in the U.S. You know, what just strikes me as, um, um, you know, uh, problematic is that they come here, and they th take master's, they go everywhere, really, in Europe also, and we don't send anybody there. There's, there's no American lawyers doing that in China. Now, you can say that it's the government, you know, that the American system um, is welcoming, more welcoming, perhaps, than the Chinese, you know, professional system, mm -hmm. the lawyers, but I don't, I don't think that's really the answer to the question. We, we, we're not motivated. We don't have the culture in the profession, in the country, mm -hmm. to go there like you have and practice and set up shop and learn the language, the customs, the business. Um, that's really too bad. We, we should be doing exactly the same thing that they're doing. Well, I think that, that's, a, that's a really important point, Jay. Um, my observation is that in the United States, we're just too comfortable. Everybody's worrying about the uh, tailgate party, the big game on Saturday, the big university game, yeah. the NFL on Monday. Yeah. But I think what's happening in China is that, you know, the internet had changed things. People have access to knowledge base. They're hungry to learn, to gain that knowledge, to up their game in technology. Uh, and what I see now is that, uh, you know, it, it, there are opportunities for U.S., especially the law students or university students. Uh, actually, President Barack Obama, a few years ago, uh, had uh, reached an agreement with China. So um, there are generous scholarships that are offered to U.S. students who, dis who want to come to a master's program in China. Are they being taken? No, they're not. Ah, really? They're not. See? That's my point. At our law school, we have, uh, we have uh, a lot of these scholarships, but nobody shows up from the U.S. That's and, really too bad. And also the top number one law school in, in China, Redmond University, uh, people are taking advantage. Americans are not taking advantage of it. So yeah. it, it's a really, it's a one-way exchange. I mean, people from China are coming. Would your law school be fun and useful, fun and helpful to a, an American student? Well, I think it's, 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 it's good because for American students to understand the culture, to understand the thinking. Uh, to understand that uh, things are going to change in the next 5, 10, 15 years only because the Chinese world, the technology, the things they're doing and what we're going to talk about today, um, it's going to make an impact in the world. Uh, I think uh, more succinctly from what I observe is that many Chinese companies are bringing technologies, new platforms, and their language to a lot of developing countries around the world. The yeah. One Belt, One Road initiative is an example where yeah. They're bringing in a new technology. Huge, yeah, and, huge, so important. Yes, and then many of these uh, students are coming from these regions, from Europe, that along the One Belt, One Road, Europe, Russia, uh, uh, Ukraine. They're all coming to China. Scholarships. To learn, to, yes, to learn Mandarin. Uh, all the Europeans are, are at our university. Invaluable experience yes. and education and opportunity. Anyway, let's go to our principal subject. We, we've called this sh uh, show... Uh, eco-friendly transit in China, and that's because um, we want to talk about some of the newer technologies that are being used right now in China, in many places in China, for transit and trains. So can you describe what has, you know, popped up here in the last year or two? I think the, the, what has popped up is uh, China has, a, has, has, a, has developed a, 
not only the uh, high-speed bullet train, uh, and, and there's some controversy about the intellectual property uh, uh, coming over from Japan, from Germany, from Siemens, and so forth. Uh, but they're, you know, taking a different route. They're doing different things in China. And one of the things that they're doing is using uh, uh, the whole idea of smart technology in their transportation system. And so that's what I want to focus on, Jay, today. In fact, um, one of these uh, uh, pieces of technologies, China has made a, a uh, train that's uh, driverless. And it's, it's been in use in Hong Kong for a year. And it has replaced, is replacing some of Hong Kong's MTR uh, uh, subway trains. Um, so we're seeing this technology that's employed. And it's, it's a mm. China train. Mm. And they're going to go around the world and, and bring that technology. Ah, it's not just limited to China, then. Yes. The idea is so good, so workable, that it can go anywhere. So what does this look like, this, this uh, China train? Well, I, I think this, this, it looks like any other train. There are two types of trains. We're going to talk about the train on the, there's the rail train, which is, is being used now in Hong Kong. It's also being, it's also being used in a number of European cities, the mm. same smart technology. This has rail. And this is rail. You have to build a rail. And, and you know, this is timely because, you know, there was an accident recently in Amtrak on their new yeah. inaugural line yeah. that ran from Portland to Seattle. Yeah. And it was going 80 miles in a 30-mile zone and it was turning a bend. So the question was, was that possibly human error? So this whole idea of smart technology uh, may be able to prevent those kind of accidents. Mm, where the we, train hope so. is. we hope so. I mean, theoretically, smart technology would avoid any accident if you program it to avoid the accident. And I think, I think technology today is caught up in many ways, in many forms, uh, so that uh, it's, it's doing a lot of things that, that you know, uh, people are concerned about. Uh, being taken over jobs, but however, um, especially where you're dealing with mass transit, you know, this is an area where the Chinese are getting better at. They deal with uh, large populations and small populations in their country. They're dealing with improving their uh, infrastructure, um, and what they've done is they've, they've looked and seen the infrastructure around the world, and they've seen that, well, we don't want to invest in old platforms. We need to do new technology. We need to think green. We need to be eco-friendly. And this is the new prevailing uh, thought around all over China. It, it's not only in technology, but the way people do things. You don't see trash on the road anymore. Mm. Uh, you don't see people smoking cigarettes. There is no, there are no cigarettes, but people don't smoke anymore. Really? Uh, we people are concerned. And the last show we talked about was pollution, uh, where where they have curbed it down, where they really have ratcheted down, at where the, the, there's no pollution all this winter. I've been there all this winter. Uh, and I, I look at every day. What they, an improvement! It was virtually so, overnight. Virtually it was overnight. Terrible four or five yes. years ago. Now look. Right. Yeah. So that's all because of technology. You know, latest things you can do technology. So, so they've come up with this. This first of all, we, we were talking about the um, driverless rail train. Okay. Okay. Um, that's in a different category from your bullet train. And that's trains. that's what we're focusing on here. Focus today. today. So describe and, it. Well, and then, but there's a third category, and oh. this this is. Driverless, trainless, trainless, railless. Excuse me, railless. Okay, so three categories. There's the the regular rail, high speed rail that's already deployed between major cities in China. That was a mm. few years ago, and that's working well, right? It's working well. Okay, and it's it, it was not that expensive. It is not that expensive to ride it. Yeah, not expensive at all. Yeah. And, and it's preferable than catching the plane now because when you catch a plane, you have wait time, security airport, checks, airport. Not, airport. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of, it takes a lot of stress out of you. Yeah, you know, this is good for long distances. So yes, it's long distance now. So that's one category. Second category is uh, is rail, but it's it's um, smart technology. Smart technology. Yes. Third category is it's no rail and smart technology. Yes, okay. and and that's a that's the newest technology. So I thought it'd be great to introduce it to our audience today. Yeah. Um, a city called Zhuzhou, uh, China, but but Zhuzhou, China. They are it's launching, it's in Hunan. Mm -hmm. uh, they're launching a new uh, railless train system. It's called AART, excuse me, ART, Autonomous Rapid Rail Transit. Autonomous Rapid Rail Transit, ARRT. That's right. Okay. And, and this is interesting because the population of Jujo, China is about 3.96 million. Small city Small in city. China. Yeah. We got about a, a million here in Honolulu. Uh -oh. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, we have we have everywhere technology everywhere. The They're reminding us. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, the. Uh, the, their, their new system they're developing, it's going to be, the initial leg is going to be four miles for inner city travel. Mm -hmm. And so you're talking about the same size as if we are taken from Kalihi to yeah. downtown. Not much so bigger not much. than Honolulu. So, so, so they're doing this system and they're coming out with this train where it can carry either a train that has three cabins will carry 300 passengers mm -hmm. or a five cabin which will carry 500 passengers. Mm -hmm. And it travels up to 50 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a, just right for transit, actually. It, it's, for, it's for a small city, for, for a, a population yeah. where you're not talking 21 million people. Yeah, and, and we're not talking going 500 miles in a given direction. Yes. We're talking yes. about going three or four miles. Yeah. And what's, what's amazing is that this is employing the latest smart technology. It doesn't require rails to be installed. It doesn't need to require overhead. It, all it requires is a road. And it's, 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 it's designed so that it follows a certain dotted lines, or excuse me, uh, guideway. Yeah, you've shown me so. a picture of it. I'm, I'm very impressed. Imagine uh, it's kind of like a bike path kind of affair. It's um, macadam, black, black top um, on the side of the road. It's, it's, cars don't go there. You're not supposed to go there, right? Uh, and the, and the, uh, the train, as it were, follows this. This uh, dotted line, which is yes. in the center, I guess, uh, of this macadam roadway, there are no rails. Um, there are wheels, and the train has wheels. I guess that makes it kind of like a bus. There's no overhead power supply. The train is powered by batteries, mm -hmm. which are recharged at appropriate points during the day or week. Okay, and this is the most interesting part. It's on autonomous, so it can go by itself. This fabulous kind of bus, autonomous rail, railless bus thing that goes right through the center of the city, and yeah. it can go up to fifty miles yes, per yes. hour. That is something. Yes, and it's not like it's not in safe because the, the, there is also uh, monitors that go back to Central Station where somebody's watching it all the time, mm -hmm. um, watching it and making sure there are cameras on it, uh, so it, it it can be it can make sure that. If there's anything that you have to know about, uh, yeah. How they well, how do they there. collect the fares? I mean, that'd be an interesting question. They use uh, the telephone. Um, what what did you call that program? Yes, to collect the fares. You can collect the fares. Uh, first of all, smart card technology. Smart card. Okay. Uh, and, that's out of uh, that's out of uh, Hong Kong or um, or out of uh, Japan, no? Well, they had that from Beijing for many years. Mm, okay. Uh, the subway system, smart cards. You can use the bus. You can use the uh, okay. trains. The subway transit card, a transit card, and you just swipe it, mm -hmm. uh, and you put money into the card. And, and in in Beijing, for example, you can actually on your smartphone you can load. There's an app for that, and you can just simply you don't have to go to the train station to put money. You can do it yeah. on your smartphone, and then yeah. just swipe it over. When you, yeah, when yeah. You or, or you use phone. your Samsung smartwatch like this one. That's right. Holding holding it up. There it is. I, I see it, and I don't see it yet. There, that's smart. You could use this because I can use this with a credit card machine. It will it will run the charge on the credit card machine, right. whether the clerk knows it or not. I can do that, and so I suppose the future is smart watches like this for the same purpose. I'm, I'm sure it's going to happen. It's, yeah. it's going to happen, and it's amazing. But you know, there's there's so many things that there's so much flexibility in a system like this because it's using the latest technology. Um, you can put onboard entertainment, all digital things. Um, it'd be a wonderful experience for the for the passengers, um, uh, and you you can also uh, very easily uh, are able to track your demographics um, because is, of the smart card. Of the smart card, because it can make a record of everybody who's coming and going and how long they stayed and all that. So exactly. is this expensive? I mean, how do you pay for something so fancy like this? Well, it's interesting because from my understanding, uh, the company that has designed it, uh, they did their studies, their market research studies, uh, and it's, 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 it's a, a lot cheaper than, you know, the subways. It's, it's, you, the overhead is a lot less because it's just yeah. tires. Yeah. It's just maintenance of the road. Yeah, uh, and, right, um, and, the, and the road doesn't require much maintenance. It doesn't require much because maintenance. It's only going to have this thing. And which is um, kind of lightweight, you know, it's electric, it's not a combustion engine. Um, and it, I've seen the pictures, it looks pretty good. Uh, it's kind of like a souped up bus on steroids kind of thing. 
Several buses together. Several buses all linked together. 500 people in a, in a train of buses. That's what it amounts to. But it's quite remarkable how they, they get it to go on the sensors. They put the sensors down in that dotted line in the middle of the road. It just follows the sensors. So there's really not a lot of navigation issues around it. Follow the yellow brick road. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is made in China, huh? designed it's, in China, the whole mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, and and how how much deployment? I mean, where has it been deployed so far? Well, it's it, it's 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 been made in Xi'an, out of the Hunan, China. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually uh, it's 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 it, the technology is is made for domestic right now for domestic use. Yeah. So yeah. Um, we'll probably see that in the smaller cities. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's pretty interesting that you know we read about all the geopolitical things uh, that uh, Xi Jinping has been doing. Uh, we see him, you know, extending China's influence all over the world in every continent. Uh, one one road, uh, you know, initiative is is crossing many many countries to extend China's influence all the way to Europe. Quite amazing, but this sounds like it's not just a train or a trainless train. It sounds like it's part of that initiative. Because once it's perfected in China and Hunan or else, or elsewhere, um, it's something that China can export mm -hmm. and put in every city that, well, every city needs some kind of transit and be better than buses, uh, presumably cheaper, more efficient, less labor, a whole enchilada. This could be an extension of China's influence. No? Yes, well, that's why the, the whole China's economy is changing. It's moving up the value chain. Uh, no longer it's the garage uh, mat factory. Um, and the, the whole theme of China is innovation, uh, uh, green technology. Uh, this is all designed not only for Chinese needs, but it's, it's good for their exports. Yeah, sure. Um, and and so, uh, so now they, they are formidable competitors to Japan's rail, uh, as well as some of the other um, rail uh, builders around the world. Uh, so they're exporting the rail around the world. Yeah. They, they, I think they're going to do something in Southeast Asia, a very major project. Yeah. We're seeing uh, the whole One Belt, One Road initiative reaping in benefits uh, to China because of factors that yeah. they can deliver now. They can deliver trains. They can deliver mass right. transit systems right. to a lot of places where, uh, f uh, for example, large population centers uh, where you can't afford to put in something that's very expensive. Yeah, this isn't hard. All you need is a slice of the road, uh, macadam top. Those sensors are probably easy to install. Uh, save all the money on rail. Save all the money on overhead power or anything like or under underground power. All you need is the the train, and anybody could build the um, the roadway. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to talk about exactly how interesting this might be to Hawaii Nei, right after we come back from this this break. Russell Liu. An American lawyer practicing in Beijing and teaching in a local diplomatic school. What is it? International Beijing uh, Foreign Studies University. Foreign Law Studies school. University uh, in Beijing, and we're going to talk about how this could be a kind of an innovation arbitrage to bring it not only outside of China in 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 the west of China, but also here in Hawaii. Ooh, it's we'll be exciting. right back. Very exciting. I'm excited to even think about talking about it. Yeah. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music.
Okay, we're back. I told you. I told you we'd come back. Me and Russell Liu, we're talking about trains, transit. We're talking about <laughs> ARRT, the Autonomous Rapid, Rapid Rail, Rail transit, transit System, which is being built in China and presumably will be exported from China along the One Belt, One Road uh, initiative going west. Um, but also, you know, this is something that Hawaii might be interested in, uh, if not just for Honolulu, I mean, where, where our rail initiative seems to be, you know, stuck on a long-term basis and way too expensive, well, you know, also for the neighbor islands. Yeah. So how do you see that playing out, if possible? Well, first, let me talk about the One Belt, One Road, Jay. Please. You, you, you touch a very interesting point. Yeah. You know, the One Belt, One Road, we're talking about the traditional One Belt, One Road, the Marco Polo route that went through uh, northwest China, through the Middle East, through uh, Europe. Mm-hmm. You're talking about the the, the old uh, what, a, a route that went from China down from Shanghai, Yiwu, all the way down to Southeast Asia, around India, to Kenya, up through Africa, and to um, Europe. The third one about one road, which people haven't identified yet, is the China's movement of their economy into South America, and that is the new road the one belt one road that passes through Hawaii. So just think about it. If we're in the middle of that route, it goes, we can be very important economically. Think well, if it. that's the reality, we have to recognize it as the reality and maybe somehow find opportunities and advantages in it. Um, you know, we haven't had, aside from a few guys buying high, high rise condo apartments for astronomical sums, I'm not sure that we've had a whole lot of um, China investment here right now in this iteration, such as the kind of investment we had when the Japanese were coming. Well, those are different times, Jay. There's a time when you had land that could be zoned for hotels. Mm -hmm. All these zoned land for hotels are gone. Yeah. Nobody has thought about it, yeah. of what you can do. The capacity does not allow for uh, hotels, uh, excuse me, the, the present capacity doesn't allow for a lot of Chinese travelers to come here. Eighty-something percent is the occupancy rate. So that means very few rooms are left for the Chinese, if you want larger numbers well, to come As here. a result, I remember uh, Madam Wu, remember her? Yes. She came here on the way to Seattle during the Lingle administration, a big party, you know, and everybody was trying to woo Madam Wu. Uh, you know, she was like number two or three in the government. She was way up there in Citic somewhere, I think. Um, and she had a bunch of guys with money bags ready to buy stuff in, in Hawaii and ultimately in Seattle. Well, she didn't buy anything here. She went to Seattle and bought a lot of airplanes is what she did. And, uh, you know, they have passed us by in terms of industrial, um, you know, investment, I think. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's time for us to look more carefully at them, especially in view of the South American road you're talking about. So. What could we do Showcase with this, this ARR Showcase technology. Yeah, go ahead. I, I really think that having uh, some successful technology uh, out here in Honolulu that is Chinese-made innovation will bring a lot of, attract other potential economic opportunities to this place. And I still firmly believe, born and raised and growing up here, that Honolulu can be a very unique Singapore uh, of the United States, if it chooses to be. We have, the, we have a lot of bright kids here, many kids who are uh, technological savvy, but it, it, it's, it's now how do we bring that here? One of the ways is, is, is really when you showcase and you have Chinese technology here, the Chinese will start to take notice. They become much more friendlier. You develop relationships. It's a vehicle of relationships, not only just because it's going to fit your transportation needs, but it's you, you're giving them a, a place to show their technology. Think about that. When you have a place where you can show the technology, you don't, you, don't have, you don't need a convention center where big rig trucks will come up because we can't do that. When technology is here and you start to have all kinds of technology here that comes from China, mm -hmm. then you become a showcase. You mm -hmm. become all of a sudden a magnet for business. And you have a good partner. You negotiate good partner. a good partnership relationship with them. It's a win-win-win. Then you also so. bring American tech companies here. Because right. if the Chinese are here, and you join give jobs to local people to, to innovate the deployment of this equipment um, and to maintain it, so so and here to operate it. So I want to I want to give you a case study, okay, Russell. 
Um, we can talk about, you know, uh, how to deploy this in Honolulu, but let's wait. Let's talk about how to deploy it in Maui first. Maui has terrific traffic jams. Maui has certain, um, you know, relative to Maui, high-density population centers that could be connected. How, how would this work um, if a deal was made, say, between the county of Maui, just for example, and, and the Chinese who are operating and, you know, developing and exporting and deploying these ARRT trainless trains? I love that idea of what you're starting off here, case study Maui. Yeah. Maui is, is a place where you don't want to destroy, it's a fragile you know, ecosystem, it's a beautiful environment. Yeah. You don't want to put overhead tracks, trails, and you, you don't want to spend a lot of money tearing up the roads. You don't want to disturb, you know, I, I have a real sensitivity, because my heart is in Hawaii, sensitivity to digging up the ground, you know, um, disturbing, you know, uh, traditional Hawaii. Well, it cares a lot land. about uh, about electric it, energy. It cares a lot about right. transportation. It cares about uh, you know renewables, driving, creating electric energy, and then driving trains. It's just like this. This would fit within what do you want to call it? The the frontier of Maui's thinking about electrical generation well, and and renewables. And this is great because the work is already done. The major work has been done yeah. because Maui has charted out where the roads are, yeah. where you can go, where you're not disturbing the environment. Yeah. So you're not going to build something on top of that. You're going to simply modify it to, to, to have smart lanes, these dotted lines through the rail, dedicated routes, and you're going to bring clean, electric-powered, trackless. Yeah. Uh, can make, you can make charging stations using solar power or wind power for that and matter. And Maui would be great for that, where the sun is shining every day of the year. And you could connect, um, you know, the connect population centers and commercial centers all together. And if you found you didn't get enough traffic from one or the other, you could change the route without spending any significant additional That's money, right. right? And it would be great for Maui because I'll tell you why. You can bring that technology to Maui, improve it, and start to create technology research development centers yeah. and link up different parts of Maui. Yeah. Kanapali with a Kalu. Yeah, exactly. By having this, and you can take tourists across there. Yeah. Safe, eco-friendly yeah. way. Yeah, and I'll give you another one that you can see what you think. You know, the Big Island was doing this for a while before Billy Kanoi, remember him? Um, and I don't think they're doing it anymore, but they had free buses. So if you worked in a hotel in Kona, but you lived in Hilo, you could get on a free bus. This saves you a midnight ride across the saddle road and all that. It was a, a real a great thing for the people of Big Island. Too bad they don't have it anymore. But, you know, if you want to incentivize people to ride this as a demonstration, if you want to incentivize the success of it, you make it free. Yes. And everyone can ride it. Tourists can ride it. The local people can ride it. People can ride it to work. They can ride it to recreation. They can ride it home. Um, and so, uh, uh, and you can change the, you know, the route so easily, it, it would adapt itself to exactly where you need to put people. Um, really interesting possibilities there. So in the model, what do you think about a free ride and how would you be able to do that? I think a free ride is terrific. Nobody's going to turn that down, Jay. You know, you can get your revenue through advertising revenue, onboard entertainment that will tell the tourists where to go. Yeah. Think about that. Think yes. about that. Yes. You can take the tourists also on this free ride to your sponsors, drop them off to the Kona farm area. You, you galvanize all the Kona coffee. This, this, this well, and, and talk about the Kona. Big Island. You know the Big Island has greater distances than Maui, but still the um, Big Island has plenty of renewables too. In fact, it has so much renewables that it can't use all the renewables that it has. So you can put these charging stations for the train along the way or at the, you know, the endpoints of the route, um, and you could essentially charge it with renewables and spend very little in terms of operating it. And think about it, if you can increase your, your tourist revenue because you have this, then it makes sense to partner with the, uh, with the tourist and the companies that, where it will go to Akaka Falls. It will pass all these areas and stop. Yeah. And, and, and people will be able to enjoy the islands. Uh, Less car accidents, less pollution. Yeah, all electric. Yeah, and uh, and the autonomous thing is is it's being perfected. Uh, what I see recently, 
the Army now has a helicopter that can be operated autonomously. It's not even, it's not even remote radio. It's you just set it on a course, tell it what to do, and it does it. A, a big UE helicopter can do that. Um, so autonomous vehicles are, are, be, are coming of age. It's not just the drones. It's all co and cars, of course. Mm. So this rides parallel, if you'll excuse the expression, with the whole autonomous movement. Um, we got to get on board with this. You know, one of the big problems about renewable energy is we haven't used it efficiently in transportation. This could solve that problem. We just got to open up, you know, to a Chinese um, uh, import um, and, and start working with them and learning from them and, and being part of the program that they suggest to us. So, so let's do this, all right? Okay? I'm what do on you board, think? Jay. Yeah. I'm on okay. board. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we just need to be open minded and, and look at the technology. Um, there are lessons to be learned. Um, this technology, for example, the, uh, the trackless train or the driverless train, it's already been employed already in some European countries. The Chinese tech is in operation. Mm -hmm. And so I see great possibilities. And I see that <clears throat> here maybe it is a, a way to supplement. They are our new heart, a new system that was supplemented. Mm. For example, if, if we are can't fill, fill the infrastructure, you know, one of the things I'm most concerned about coming from Hawaii is that you're going to dig up along the way a lot of land. There may be traditional Hawaiian um, burial sites. Um, and, you know, you, we don't want to disturb that. We need to preserve all of this. And having this over existing roads. Imagine, in this city of Jujo, that track system is four miles, initial track in the inner city area. So from- The non-track the non track. The non-track, the trackless the, uh, rail system. It is four miles. Think about it, from Kalihi to downtown Honolulu, that's 3.2 miles, okay? From downtown Honolulu to Waikiki, that's 2.9 miles. It's made to order. It's because think about it. No, no condemnation. Tourists. Right? No, no expensive rails or overhead power. It's all renewable right there, and it's largely See? autonomous. The whole thing could operate by itself. And P.S., whatever you do with the route, such as it is, has been planned or stuck, whatever the case may be, we still need to go to the university. Right. We still need to yes. go to the airport. We still need to go um, to Waikiki and other neighborhoods like Kailua, like right. the whole you know, other side of it. So this is a perfect extension. If you want to build the thing that the, the monster we have created um, for rail now today, if you want to extend it, this is a great way to extend it. Yeah? Great way to extend it, supplement it. Think yeah. about a triangle, and, and from downtown Honolulu to uh, UH Mona, it's 3.9 miles. So you're talking about a triangular system that can move people, a lot of people. You're talking at one, one uh, tra train will take 300 people. Yeah. And it can go up to 50 miles an hour. Yeah. And it will take move people safely across the roads. Russell, you and I, we get so excited about these things. We can hardly contain ourselves, and we don't realize that we're out of time. So, Russell, you, thank you so much for thank coming. Thank you, Jay. Down. Talking about ARRT instead of HART. It's really, a, it's really an eye opener to talk to you about this. We need HARRT. 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 Thank you, Russell. Thank you. Aloha. 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 Aloha.